Hi, everybody. Um, if you can see this, um, welcome to Global Learnings on Future of School. We are going to be, we, are, we have Namita Devi Dayal in conversation with Andreas, Wendy, uh, Zen, Shaheen, um, as well as Almas. Um, we are here today uh, to talk about the future of school, and I'm actually not going to spend too much time uh, talking, sharing uh, what we're going to be talking about with you. I will just get you through one quick thing, which is that today, for all the people in the audience, we will be taking your questions and your thoughts through Slido. So make sure you go to slido.com, and this is your um, code 2169670. It's 2169670. We'll keep putting it this up on the live stream as we go along. But before we do that, uh, let's just, um, I'm going to hand over to Sandeep and you can take over from there. Remember 2169670 for all your questions. Thanks so much for that, Arshia. Hi, everyone. It's good to be here with all of you. And for those of you joining us, it's also good to uh, to have you here as well. Um, just a big thank you for everyone that's made it today. As I should mention at the circle, we're on a we're on a mission to say, how do we reinvent schools so that they they work better for kids and so that they prepare kids for for what is a rapidly changing world? And we're excited to talk about a topic today that feels both relevant as well as just highly needed, and that is, you know, what is the future of school? And what do schools need to be so that they keep up and stay ahead of this rapidly changing world? And and to do that, we are joined by this incredible, incredible group of people who not only care deeply about this, but people who are just doing some really important work to accelerate it. Um, we have with us today Almas, who is a, is a social impact entrepreneur. She's also a teacher. She's a student that's been a part of Teach Vineyard for more than 10 years. Um, and in addition to being in school, she also runs an NGO called The Basket of Joy. And so Almas, it's good to have you here with us. Um, we have with us Zen, a seventh grade student at the Bombay International School, and someone who is incredibly passionate about education as well. And Zen, it is good to have you here too. Um, we have Wendy Kopp, the founder of Teach for America and Teach for All, someone who is who is reshaping and molding how we think about leadership across the world. Wendy, a big thank you to being here as well. Um, we have with us Shaheen Mistry, the founder of Teach for India, and before that, the founder of the Akanksha Foundation someone who is always innovating among many things and, and someone who is just reshaping how we think about power, how we think about the role of children in today's education system, um, not only across India, but across the world. And Shaheen, thank you for being here as well. We have with us Andrea Schleicher, someone who is the Director of Education and Skills for the OECD, is most well known for his groundbreaking work overseeing PISA, an assessment that has changed and is just changing how we think about education across the world. And then finally, we have with us our moderator, uh, Namata Dev Dial, a senior journalist with the Times of India, the author of several books, and someone who is just influencing the conversation in India in, in countless ways. And so Namata, a big thank you as well. Um, folks, it is incredible to be, be sharing this platform with all of you as someone who who knows each of you in various ways. Like It's just a privilege to be here. It's been a privilege to be able to be a part of your journeys, to watch your journeys. Um, and I can't think of a better people to be anchoring this conversation. Um, and so an enormous amount of gratitude. And Namitha, I'm going to hand this over to you to, uh, to take us forward. Thank you, Sandeep. Thank you so much. And at the outset, I should say that I um, am not from the field of education. Um, but I think, I think it's equally important um, to be a parent and um, an observer of, of our world and what we're creating you know, for our future generations. And so I hope that this conversation um, can really navigate a lot of spaces and bring us some insight. Um, and I am an old friend of Shaheen's and an abiding fan. And so I think, you know, just like she does, as always, conned me into doing this, and I'm delighted. Um, so to start with, I thought that we should ask all of you to talk a little bit about your personal journeys for many of us who may not be um, familiar with them. And um, perhaps we can start with uh, Wendy. Um, a little bit about how you started, well, first Teach for America and how it sort of grew into Teach for All and where you are today. 
Thank you. Um, well, I got started in, and it's such a pleasure to be here and I'm looking forward to learning from you all on this topic as much as anything. Um, and I'm really inspired about what the circle is working to do. So thanks for including me. Um, I got into this work over 30 years ago um, when I was a senior in college and thought of the idea of Teach for America, essentially why wasn't our generation being called upon as aggressively to channel our energy into schools in our country's low income communities as we were being called upon to put our energy into banks. And that started a journey that has, I mean, I feel so privileged to have been part of this work that has enabled me to see, you know, schools and classrooms all over my own country, but at least as inspiringly now all over the world. Um, about 17 years ago, I met 13 people, including Shaheen Mistri from 13 different countries who were just really interested in doing something similar to Teach for America in their countries. And that is what inspired the Teach for All Network, um, now of 60 independent locally led organizations in 60 countries around the world that have all come together around this purpose of developing collective leadership to ensure all kids fulfill their potential. Um, and I think this journey in particular, all the incredible, brilliant, diverse folks across the Teach for All network have really reshaped my own understanding about what we need to be working towards in education. Um, I think so many of us, I mean, came to this because we were so driven to create a more equitable world, a world in which all kids have the chance to attain an excellent education. Um, but I think over time, we've just all realized that catching kids up in an outdated system doesn't get us where we need to be. Um, and so we need to be working both towards equity and towards really reshaping what we're working towards in education so that students are developing holistically as people who can shape a better future for themselves and for all of us. So um, that's a little bit about what, about what brings me here. Namita, thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you. Andreas, we'd love to hear from you a little bit more about your journey. Yes, thank you very much. And, and first of all, if you think, you know, there are people who can transform education and reimagine it, it's people like you. You know, don't believe there's going to be a magic politician who's going to sort that out one day. You know, what policy can do is to provide the conditions in which you can do your work really well. Uh, but ultimately, transformation and that's not just true in education in any sector it really de it depends on the people at the front line who you know know the students best and who can reimagine the learning environments and uh, <clears throat> really i think that's why i think the conversation you're having here is 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 really important i started to look at this from the other end of the spectrum uh, doing international comparison and often you know we go into this with the assumption that poverty is destiny you know, there is always going to be children from disadvantaged backgrounds who are having difficulties and then students who are lucky basically get a good education. Actually, when you look at this around the world, you find that's not true. Actually, there are some education systems that became really, really good in giving all children an excellent education. In some countries that, are <laughs> that have become a lot better in doing this. And that really got me interested that actually... These are not big, immutable kind of issues, but uh, we can do something about it and we can learn from and with each other on what the policies and practices are. And, and, and in particular, what are the conditions actually to build, you know, as Wendy said, you know, leadership mm -hmm. talent and create uh, an environment where great people want to work and where great people can do <coughs> really, really good work. And um, so the comparative perspective is really what we often lack in education. The uh, education is, you know, uh, dominated by many ideas, many beliefs, and actually we know very little, you know. And uh, what I found very quickly is that in the medical sector, we spend about 17 times as much on innovation and research than in the field of education. We, we know it's really important. We need to be at the frontier. You know, we need to, you know, when there is a new kind of pandemic, <laughs> we, <laughs> we need to do something about it. In education, we don't have that mindset. We often treat education as an individual art. And uh, so making education not less of an art, but more of a science really was uh, very much what uh, 
you know, I try to, to contribute to that. People look more outwards. And I think it's not just true for systems. Often you have, you know, teachers not knowing really very much of what neighboring teachers are doing. We don't have that collaborative culture that actually can change practice and re reinvent practice. You don't invent, you know, education and pedagogy as a single teacher. You can be a genius, but you will not do that. You can only do that by building that new professional culture and uh, that collaborative culture. So looking outwards, <coughs> showing people what's actually possible. You know, another thing that people say is, oh, you have to be a rich country to pro provide a good education system. It's not true, actually. You know, you see some countries that have actually quite modest resources that have built a really, really good education system. Look at, you know, Vietnam as an example, or Estonia in Europe. You know, they're not rich countries that belong to the poorest in the region and we're able to change the needle. So I think actually <clears throat> that's... And Lise, I'd love you to talk a little bit about one of those countries, um, uh, you know, at some point in this discussion, because it's it's great to have live models that have worked mm -hmm. and see what we can learn from them. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I guess just generally, Shaheen, if you can, I mean, a lot of people already know the work that you've done, but if you can talk a little bit about your journey and where you are today, um, and you're at the cusp of the collective and the circle and sort of just create that arc for us, please. Yeah, thank you, Namu. And, and hi, everybody. It's great, great to be here. Um, when Wendy was starting Teach for America around that time, I was starting Akanksha. I started my journey as a teacher um, and spent many years working very closely with children and with teachers. And I think that led to me learning about um, the Teach for America model many years later and saying when you're able to just see the power of what education can do, like actually see the power of it, um, it it's almost like feels like a responsibility to say, how do we do it at scale? Because it's so important and it's so transformative. And and so that's really been been my, my journey to try to, to take the idea that that Wendy had originally and say, how do we build a national movement within India of leaders um, who really transform children's lives and transform the very system of education that, that all of us know is just outdated and not, not working anymore? Sure. Almas, do you want to tell us a little bit about your journey, both as a student and what you eventually ended up um, doing with this education. Like I would say, my journey as a student has been like a coaster, like from learning to growing and implementing those learning. Actually, up to that has been like school has what I have still like school have always taught us like how to do, tell us what to do, but they have never tell us like how those learning outside the school. So like, like I ended up being social entrepreneur, like it was, was uh, showing those skills, like schools taught us those things, like do this, do that. But they doesn't tell us how to do it, like taking those small steps, learning how to do it, remembering those steps and mistakes, learning from it. And like, yeah, that's how it has been. I'm so sorry, I was on mute. Um, Zen, tell us a little bit about yourself and what grade you're in and um, what school you're at. So um, I go to the Bombay International School and I'm in grade seven. I'm, um, I'm really grateful for the education I have. Being an IB school, there's a lot of focus on inquiry-based learning and holistic development. Um, around a year ago now, we were introduced to the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, and I decided to go further in and research about the education system in India. And I was really inspired and um, I, I really got interested in this. And um, I'm really inspired by the people on this panel and thrilled to be here. And I dive, deep, um, I dive deeper in research and I really wanted to explore this vast subject because there's so much to understand 
and also seeing the disparities across India. India being such a huge country, of course, there's major disparity in the education system. And I wanted to take action towards this. And um, so me and my friends set up this website. We interviewed um, experts such as Ms. Shaheen sitting here today as well. And um, we, yeah, we truly um, wanted to research more and get more into this incredible field. So since we're um, sort of trying to talk about the future and, and a, a new reimagined educational system across the world, which is a dauntingly vast subject, um, I'm just going to share this one quote um, that the Circle team had shared with me, which is that in the 1970s, a Gallup study revealed that the three skills employers most value in their workforce are reading, arithmetic, and writing. And today, they are critical thinking, creativity, and collaborative problem solving. And I'd like um, each of you all to talk about this um, in the context of... Um, well, you know, we've been through a pretty dramatic couple of years, and it's very evident that a lot of the certitudes that we've had and the hierarchies that we've um, sort of taken for granted have been, um, you know, broken down and everything's almost topsy-turvy, which is incredible because it gives you a starting point where you can really reimagine things on many levels, um, starting with the whole technology platform being used to create more equitable education to some extent. Um, so I wonder if, uh, Andreas, you could talk a little bit about this, uh, especially in the context of how you believe the kinds of things that education seeks to provide today uh, has to change or has changed. It's, it's clear, it's very clear. I mean, one can see it anecdotally all around, you know, that um, the kinds of the, uh, empathy and compassion and understanding, and I think above all, being able to navigate the change um, seems to be one of the most important criteria. So how do you feel that's going to happen? Is it happening already? Or is it just going to create further inequity? Um, yeah, you know, very good questions The though. The, we, we looked at this from the other end, you know, we uh, can see very clearly what the drivers are for those new competencies that you outlined. You know, the kind of things that are easy to teach, easy to test, the reproduction of subject matter content is now done by technology. Yeah. Uh, the world no longer rewards you just for what you know. Google knows everything. It rewards you for what you can do with what you know, and it rewards you for being able to work with people who are different from you. You know, nature creates us to be very comfortable to work with people who look like us and think like us and work like us. And it's actually hard work in education to make people comfortable to see issues from different perspectives, different ideas. But once again, technology makes this inevitable. You know, technology is going to put you into those echo chambers where you are, you know, pushed to, you know, where your own beliefs are reinforced and you are, you know, not looking other, at other aspects. So I think that's very, very clear. The world around us demands a very different range of knowledge, skills, attitudes, and I would also include values. You know, I think often we, we see them at the margin of education, but actually probably they need to become very, very central to this. So you can actually make a science out of this. It's not just postulating, you know, certain competences. You can actually uh, make this uh, quite, quite clearly uh, visible. That doesn't diminish, you know, the importance of literacy and numeracy, but even there, you know, in the past, literacy was about extracting information from prefabricated text, texts. You know, you had, you know, newspaper editors who beautifully wrote the world for you, and then you just read it. Today, you get your answers on Google, and you have to navigate between 10,000 different kind of answers. And so even the, you know, the, the standard kind of repertoire of schools needs to be fundamentally uh, rethought. And that that will continue to evolve. You know, I think the biggest mistake <coughs> we could make is say, okay, we have figured out what you need to learn. We now build a new curriculum, then teach, uh, educate teachers to do that. We will be in the same trap in, in, in 10 or 15 years' time, I think. We need to have a dynamically evolving education systems where people at the front line actually see how the world is changing and then, you know, adapt, you know, what is being taught and how they teach. 
So, um, Wendy, I'm curious if you were to think of one um, sort of broad overriding uh, intervention that would bring in this new thought process. Can you sort of come up with that? Like, I mean, it's a, it's a very obviously broad question, but is there anything that comes to mind on, especially on the idea of um, being able to navigate uncertainty and change, which mm. is really not something that's taught in traditional schools um, with the traditional yeah. curriculum, you know? I mean, what's coming to mind for me, you know, as a network, we stepped back probably, I don't know, eight or nine years ago and really asked ourselves, I mean, first of all, what are we all working to accomplish together over the next 25 years? And part of that was like, really, we were trying to rethink our vision. Um, and which has historically been one day all kids will have an excellent education, but what do we mean by excellent education, right? So we, we were asking the question, we started by looking at where will the world be in 25 years, right? And because that was the starting point, we were looking at how much the planet is degrading and the economy is changing and it, it was super overwhelming when you think about that, right? And that's what led us to really come together with this kind of revelation and it had been bubbling up in lots of places prior to that, but that if today's students are not developing as leaders who can navigate uncertainty and shape a better future, there's no hope, you know, for any of our aspirations for peace and sustainability and all of this. Um, and from that point, we started rethinking, you know, everything. Like, what is it that differentiates teachers who are actually developing their students as leaders? What are they working towards? And, you know, what has emerged from those studies is, you know, a framework that, you know, lots of people have different frameworks about what they're working towards, but at a high level, we need to be developing students' agency, um, their awareness of the world and of their place in it, their their sense of well-being so that they can bring their full selves, um, you know, their sense of connectedness and empathy to others and their problem solving and critical thinking skills. Like, I, I think it's no one thing that will prepare people to navigate uncertainty. It's like we need to develop them holistically. Um, and so I guess my overarching thought, and, and I, I'm thinking about a school I was visiting three weeks ago in Colombia, and Shaheen, your personal impact is being felt in this village in Colombia, in this school, no kidding. <laughs> in the sense that I think it was so much Shaheen and Teach for India and the kids education revolution that kind of put forth across our network this notion that we need to be developing students leadership today. Um, and we went to a school which, and we went there because it is known as having the highest academic outcomes in a particular place. But we walk into this school and there's a band and there's, there's so much. In fact, I just pulled up a testimonial that a girl gave to me, a student, um, that I'm gonna read to you really fast. She says, it's a whole letter about her school. And in the second paragraph, she says, love, a word that everyone knows, but only some find its meaning. This place shows the true meaning of love and service because it is present in all of our work. I used to think that school is just a cycle in which each one had their individual process, but here I found another family. And, you know, I guess it just really brings to life, and that too is an idea that Teach for India has put everywhere, right? Like we need to lead with love and put that at the center and I think that is part of what we need to do. Like we need all kids to feel loved and supported and like they're part of and contributing to a community. Um, you know, the investment that school makes in the leadership development of the students and how that fosters their desire to learn and, and their academic interests, like it's all connected, right? Um, but I, I think that's the kind of education that will prepare kids to, you know, reshape the world today in their communities and tomorrow to navigate uncertainty and be at, at their best. So, um, 
You know, I um, am actually in the process of researching an article for the paper, for the Times of India, where I um, write, um, which has left me so aghast that when I hear you say things like this, I'm like, oh, my God, but we're so far removed from that. Um, this is really about how the whole <clears throat> informal tuition system um, that has sort of developed a, a, around schools is entirely geared towards, you know, a very aspirational, a very anxiety driven uh, sort of student outcome. And I'm seeing that in a, a lot of elite schools in, well, in India, especially, because I think we've, you know, kind of made it a very, uh, a, a, a very sort of like uh, acceptable thing to have this whole expensive informal education system. So how, Shahin, maybe you can address this question because it causes me a lot of distress, both personally and on a wider scale. Um, you know, there seems to be this growing aspirational community of kids and parents in education in India who are so kind of competitive that they've lost sight of something and there's any amount of money being just, you know, shoved into... Uh, a, a goal-based um, education rather than the kinds of things that Wendy just described. And then the rest of the world just seems to be scrambling around trying to figure things out. And it's it's all very sort of discombobulated. Um, and I, I, I wonder if you can talk about, because you have successfully bridged many of those spaces, at least in India. And so can you talk about that? Because we do live in a country where the the inequity is at a pretty um, phenomenal level. Um, yeah, yeah. Thanks, Namita. I mean, I, I don't think there are any any easy answers to what's going to reverse it. I think um, you know, building on Wendy's point on student leaders, I think we need to like nurture student leadership. Um, proof point by proof point. We need proof points at the student level, at the classroom level, at the school level. And then I think we need to amplify those examples to make people see that, that it's possible. We have to continue to evolve and call out what has led to that um, and then spread that in, in the best way uh, possible. And I think at the root of it, for me, um, is people. I think, you know, we, we tend to look for silver bullet solutions and while of course there is the important role for curriculum and technology and infrastructure and all the other pieces uh, the single most important component um, is the human being and so how do we infuse the system at all levels with the leadership needed to have this different vision and be committed to the really hard work um, that it's going to take to translate that into into, into reality um, and you know we couldn't hear almas too well in the last in the last piece but like the the enterprise she has started called basket of joy is just unbelievable like she started this when she was in school she wanted to serve not just one aspect of a disadvantaged population but multiple so she decided to source baskets from commercial sex workers and give them an income. She then filled those baskets with fruits sourced from, from farmers, organic fruits. Um, she then um, hired a service, um, a delivery service with hearing impaired couriers to actually um, deliver these baskets, people. And like she figured all of this out when she was in school. Um, and this is unbelievable, but the real power is to say, how does Almas's story stop becoming a story? And how does, as Andreas and, and Wendy said, like, how do we make school about like getting kids to like be in touch with what they really want to shift in the world and then drive their learning through the solving of real things around them and the creating of, of real things around them? Um, so so I, I think that's what you need to do. And you need to just mobilize many, many more people to take the small steps. And Namit, I'll say one, one last quick thing. I think a big evolution for me on my journey was in for many years, I searched for like the big thing that would solve the problem. And today I sit here realizing that it's like millions of people doing the little things 
that's going to be the sustainable force of change. That's and it's great. Really nice that's great. That's great. Because it really, it really is a, a very empowering thing to say because then it makes it makes one feel like, hey, as long as you do that little bit in that little sphere of influence, it can actually have a ripple effect potentially. Um, I, I wonder uh, what, uh, and this is an open question and we can um, address, uh, you know, anyone uh, uh, can, uh, can offer to answer this. Do you believe that having more integrated schools that bring together people from different backgrounds in terms of their personal challenges and their class backgrounds and, um, you know, sort of like is, is one of the solutions? Because I know that some schools in India have um, experimented with that in certain states. Um, I'm not sure where that leads, but uh, um, Andreas, would you maybe address that? Have you seen that happen in any countries where it's worked or has it led to you know, what we call jugad over here, where people just change their dresses and try and get around it. Well, again, I think this is an area where we see huge variability and our evidence really shows the earlier you track people into different kind of educational pathways, the greater the impact of social background on learning outcomes. So the more you can actually integrate students, the more likely you will see benefits for all. You know, one of the most interesting results from our PISA assessments is that the more equitable an education is, the more you see better overall results. Because, you know, for children from wealthy backgrounds, you don't make such a great difference. You know, education doesn't actually make a big difference for students who have everything in other ways. The big difference comes for students who do not have any other opportunities. And therefore, you know, if you can actually integrate schools, you're going to see better outcomes. That's what we see in Northern Europe. I also must say <coughs> most of the East Asian systems are really, really good at that. There is very little tracking and streaming going on. They are actually very demanding on every student and uh, make sure that and they do that not just by, you know, mixing up students. That's the kind of ineffective way, you know, bus students to different schools, they do that by attract really great teachers into very difficult schools. You know, if you teach in a, in a, in a, in a difficult school, you're going to get the best support. You're going to get the best mentoring. You may get a better salary. You may get, you know, this is actually, you know, how they make this intellectually attractive for teachers to go into a tough, tough places. Incredible. You know, the state of Chiara in Brazil is an, in, another example. They have paired high and low performing schools and actually, you know, overcame much of the social divide. So absolutely, it's quite possible. And that comes from a government policy level? Um, is that an intervention? Yeah. In, the, in the case of Brazil, it came from a state level policy. In Asia, East Asia, I would say it's very much culture. Basically, huh. it's uh, basically not acceptable that you make a kind of, you know, social background visible in the education system. So as a teacher, you are responsible for the entire class. It's not about, you know, producing a great average. You're actually, you know, you lose your face if you have some students who are not that successful. So there's a lot of overall pressure on the system for everyone uh, to succeed. And, and that is harder to replicate, I guess. But Vietnam, also, I mentioned earlier, you know, they have, when they started their reforms, they, you know, didn't have great teacher education institutions. So how do you produce teachers? Well, they looked for the smartest person in the village and said, actually, you know, we're going to put you into a great school. You learn, you know, with the great teacher. And, you know, um, that has been remarkably successful. Sometimes we have to bypass this very hierarchical, bureaucratic kind of structures that actually stand in the way. Zen, um, what do you think? Like, do you think that there are kids in your class or among your friends who would ever consider becoming a teacher? Um, so I'm not too sure about that one, though. However, I do believe that as um, a school in general, we focus a lot on action taking. So there's a lot of focus on development of many skills for which you'd need that. It goes beyond the standard academic knowledge, focusing more on skills such as critical thinking, um, creativity, problem solving, etc., so um, skills like this that you truly need for the future and to truly make an impact in the world is what my school in general focuses on. And it would be really great if schools across India would um, 
together make an impact little by little, not only to the education system, but to um, India itself has a lot of problems. And to overcome these problems, it would take our generation to come together and take little bits of action, as was said before, to overcome the vast issues across India. Sure. Wendy, um, I know that you all now have a very active network of the TFA fellows across the world uh, who can share resources and experience. Um, do you do you think that that is something that will you know work towards more such ideas? Like I'm just so delighted to hear about these countries that Andreas talked about and the idea that it can happen and. Um, so, so is that something that you find? I think that I guess what we've seen is is that there are so many. I guess all these teachers and schools across the world who are working towards this end, like enabling all kids to fulfill their potential, have so much to learn from each other. And I think there's just something so powerful about stepping up from our own context and seeing how other people in a very different context culturally are pursuing the same end. Like there's just something that I think advances our thinking more quickly. Um, and so that's what we're working to do. I mean, I think it's so fascinating. Um, our community talked with both the gentleman who was kind of behind the Shanghai uh, kind of progression of the education system over the last 20 years, and also one of the gentlemen who was very involved in like Finland for about 20 years. And in bo both cases, we asked them, like, what were the biggest keys to success? Like, what led these school systems to move from where they were to be like the paragons of excellence and equity in the world? Um, and both of them said, number one, we sent our educators abroad. Both of them had the first, and, and we never talk about that in education, right? But both of them said, sending our educators to learn from others around the world was the first thing we did that helped us on our way. How fascinating is that? So I think we need to do a lot more, you know, engaging with other incredible educators around the world who are working towards the same ends. Um, and, and that is one of the things we're trying to foster at Teach for All, just enabling, you know, teachers and school leaders and school system leaders to, to learn from each other across borders. Wonderful. Almas, can you talk a little bit about um, the school that you were at while you were a student and what you think um, was the gap that the Teach for India fellow fellows um, filled and changed for you? What was it that really changed once TFI came into the picture? What was it like before? What was it like after? Just give us a little version of what was happening over there. So, like, uh, yeah, I have been in school, like a BMC school, like teachers, government, School, their way of teaching is a there's a big difference between your fellow teaching and a PMC teacher teaching. Like they they are more focused on um, good marks, attendance, getting portion complete. What they just teach and comes good. They more focus on like how the portions to be covered. They don't focus on is the student getting the concept. Are they really learning? Are they really understanding what is being taught? But TFS TFS fellows were like asking us feedback from what they taught. They really used to ask us, do we understand what the problem we are facing, how we can improve it. Like, and every student learning level was different. Like I wasn't good, uh, good that much in the RC level and some of the were good. So like we used to have extra classes for the, and we used to have a group learning where we had different sessions, group, group leaders, like we have peer body system. Like TFI has been implementing and building skills in it, like skills, like collaboration, we we were collaborating, we were pushing each other, like peers learn uh, better than we are taught by peers. Like when we lead, we learn grow, like more about ourselves and we teach, I believe. So like there was huge between TFI fellow teaching and us uh, BMC teacher teaching. And do you think that any other teachers were open to picking up some of the TFI methods? 
or was it not really being uh, changed? I still remember, like uh, when I was in secondary school, when I was in nine, ten, ten, like our school was more focuses on our grade. Like we are in tenth, we were not having like I was the head girl of our school that time, and we were having like each students were interested in difficult in different of interest. Like someone to play football, someone to do a change make. Because some want to do some project, they want to lead. But our principal said you need to focus on study. We won't allow you to do extracurricular activities. Then we had a student forum, student council meeting that we had, like asking, like we share, like with the TFI fellow. This is doesn't what we want in our school. Like we want to do something and how we can. She is like you are a head girl. Think of it like how we all students together bring the team. You need to have a student voice. In. So we started coming up and sharing and we student in a student council. Then we came up with a plan. Like uh, we'll uh, we'll get you the good marks, but you allow us to play an extra curricular activity. So uh, our boys team went to Bangalore to win the football JFK. We played JFK, uh, and we had a uh, uh, sharing circles. We had a uh, counseling room in our schools. We had lots of different activities doing in our school, but we had our grades doing it. Like you want a result, but we want ourselves something that we love, we interest in it. So. We did that. And like I remember when I was having a preliminary exam, and uh, that, that day I was in the like, KR hosting. I was the host of the day, and my principal was like, "Sir, I have to go to a uh, hosting." He was like, "You have an exam." But that day he said like the difficulty he has in the mind was like, "Like you go, like opportunity doesn't comes always." And like I was like, "There is a huge difference." There. The same person in the beginning who was stopping us to do an extra curricular activity is allowing me like leave exam. We will take the exam next day. And go to the hosting. That different, like I believe, school needs a pure support. Not only one teacher, like from principal to the different teachers, like students, like each and every holistics and each and every part of it needs a support. One students to grow. Yeah, very nice. Um, Shaheen, I wanted to ask you that. Um, what are your views on more skill based? um education happening at a younger age and and especially in a country like ours where um you know employment is a very big concern and it's um the luxury of education is almost something that's uh, second secondary to that and and it's it's sort of strange because sometimes like you know my sister as you know runs restaurants and she so often says that they they're just not able to find um enough staff to to do the various things that they need whether it's in the kitchen or in the waiting you know um, and i'm so intrigued by that because it's just like there's clearly some sort of mismatch happening between um the requirements of this new service based in you know various services that that are becoming more and more uh extensive um, and and the the skilled youngsters that could fill those gaps so is that something that you all have thought about in the whole education conversation? Yeah, I mean, I think what I wouldn't do is track kids very early on into choosing between education and, and a vocational skill. Um, I think that'll lead to an even bigger equity issue because you'll have kids who are more wealthy gravitating towards the, the academic side and, and kids who are um, less wealthy gravitating towards vocational. What I would do though, which I think will solve the problem in a different way, is just really focus on relevance in schools through academic concepts. So today there's so much that kids learn that just is not worth learning at all. Mm -hmm. Um, in school and it's not relevant and it's not linked to their real lives and it's not really going to give them anything, um, as Andrea said, you know, beyond what they can just like Google and, and find on Google. Um, I think if we get that piece right and really think very critically about what should we be teaching in school, is it relevant to the kids that we serve? Um, mm -hmm. I think kids will find their way. And at Teach for India now, we talk a lot about education being about self, other, and India. Um, and by self, we mean how can education really help you find who you are in service of the purpose that you wish to choose. But education is not just about self. It's also about how do we interact differently with people in the world 
and not only that, but 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 play a role in uplifting them to their potential. And with India, we talk a lot about how can I be a change maker for the country and the world I wish to create. And I think if we really focus in on expanding education to that definition which actually Namata is not new in India, right? That's how the gurus used to function all those years ago. Absolutely. We've just sort of lost the plot um, over time. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if we should open up to questions or just carry on the discussion. Uh, I don't think there are too many questions, so we can keep um, chatting. Um, Zen, if you were to think about a classroom or even a school reimagined to something that you and your friends would consider perfect, like your personal Hogwarts Academy, like what would you, what are some of the things that you'd love to see different, both in the classroom and in the school in general? So um, according to me, what classrooms lack usually is interaction. If students can learn in a more engaging environment, most issues will be solved because um, a bond will be formed between teachers and students, not only academically, but socially and emotionally as well, allowing schools to be a safe and fun environment for progression and growth. And I really agree what, with what Alma said about all teachers really supporting what you do and all um, the school coming together as one. Interaction is the key main important feature of schools to run, in my opinion. And um, if there can be a sort of integrated setup where um, holistic growth is taken into consideration largely, that would be um, truly ideal. So, yeah, that's what I would really like in yeah, the classroom. The interaction really is a big one because... Um, even in some of the more progressive schools, there's this very old fashioned hierarchy that exists between the teachers and administration and the students. And it causes complete dissonance because the world has changed. And I think children are just looking for more from their, um, from their uh, seniors, from the, from the people who were earlier, the sort of, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess what, what would you recommend, Andreas? Have you, you have worked, I know, in India and the PISA reports that didn't go down too well, I believe, um, coming out of India. Um, how would you recommend the motivation levels, the inspired levels of teachers change across the board? Is there is there something that you can think of, given the scale, the scope, the uh, you know inequities in India? Yeah, you know, motivation always depends on, you know, what we do and how we work. You know, if you work with, with colleagues, you trust. If you work in an environment where you find enough empowerment, actually, you don't usually worry about uh, motivation. Uh, the demotivation comes usually from disempowerment, from a kind of very kind of a lot of vertical structures in the system. And I, I do think that's something India needs to look at. The, the, the system is still very kind of formal and very kind of heavy in terms of its architecture and design and in terms of its employment structures and, and so on. And I do think in the world in which we live, you know, resilience, frontline capacity uh, are no longer luxury. You need it yeah. to adapt learning conditions to, and I, I think that's something that is, is difficult because, you know, where you take leadership capacity from, but I, I do think this is where India needs to invest. And I actually think, you know, uh, Shaheen's work, Teach for India is actually, doing exactly that i think the question is how you can put that to a larger scale and uh, <clears throat> involve you know not just teachers <coughs> who come from the outside but uh, every teacher in the system yeah. shaheen is there anything you'd like to talk about in terms of <coughs> the circle is poised to do and uh, the collective i mean it's really incredible because Every time I think, like, wow, Shine, you've done a great job. There's something new that's around the corner. And yeah, thank you for that that question. I'll answer quickly, and then I know there are lots of questions from the audience. So I think our Arshia will come in. Yeah, there are lots of questions. Um, so so the circle, um, 
was founded by, by Sandeep, who introduced us, of course, at the beginning of, of this call. But I think the most exciting thing about what the circle is trying to do is it's trying to say, like, we can do school and after school differently. Like, it doesn't need to be the way that it is. And so the circle is a group of entrepreneurs. The first 12 have just been selected um, who are going to work across India and really reinvent schools. Um, there's a a nature-based program, uh, there are arts-based programs, there are all kinds of, of different, uh, both informal and formal schools uh, that will be incubated by the circle. And the hope is to create enough proof points at school that it starts showing that a, a very different reality um, is actually possible. Thank you. Um, I'm going to try and read out some of the questions and... Um... Yeah. So is it possible um, for education to be inclusive at the global level? And do you think PISA is? I'm not sure what that means, but would you like to um, attempt to answer that, Andreas? I actually think this is a very, very important question. You know, oh. <laughs> I, I, I firmly believe if the if the world would get its act together to collectively invest in those education systems that are needing most progress, we would actually change the world. If everybody, you know, just tries to achieve marginal improvements in their own system, it's going to be very difficult to see. So I, 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 I do believe that we need to look at inclusion at the global level much more seriously, you know. Um, uh, and uh, in a way, the good thing of education is that the world does have the resources for that. You know, if you actually look at the cost, it's not breaking the bank of anyone, actually. That's different, you know, from climate change and those kinds of big problems that, you know, we don't have yet the tools. But for education, the world has the resources, the world has the tools. I think we should just focus them on where the problems are most urgent. I would say the same within countries. You know, we often have this one-size-fits-all system. We spread money, you know, equally across the country. We have to become much more nuanced to align resources with needs to ensure that the money works where it can make most of a difference. So absolutely. And, uh, you know, that's what we are trying to achieve with, with PISA, creating awareness of that. You know, we, we actually can show what the not only the disparities within countries are, but uh, what the performance gap is across the world and what would be needed to actually close that. Um, we have a question, which is, what are some of the success stories globally where networks of schools have been able to fundamentally redesign or reimagining, uh, reimagine learning in schools? Um, Wendy, do you have um, any um, knowledge about this? Um, I guess I would say in almost, well, in so many different countries in the world. There are schools and groups of educators who are who are thinking about how we reshape the learning experience, right? Like how do we rethink, you know, given a different objective, like, you know, providing a relevant education for kids that does foster their leadership and set them up to navigate uncertainty and shape a better future. What are the implications of that? Um, I think there is a lot more to be done in every, every country to, to accomplish that. Um, and, and so there's a lot more to be learned and a lot more to be done. I, I think what's encouraging is there's a lot more energy around this. That's what I'm seeing than there was say 10 years ago, but I think we're still far from being able to point to, you know, fully formed scaling networks of schools that are doing that, which is why I think the circle is so inspiring. Like I, it will become one of them alongside others that are, are emerging in different places. Um, is it possible for companies to bring significant change in education like elsewhere without government intervention, or is it going to remain dependent on policy? Um, okay. just, just to, just to um, kind of add to that, Jitesh is online with us right now, the person who asked this question. So we can maybe ask him about the context as well. Jitesh, yeah, do you want I, to just like ask that question in, independently? Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Thank you. Thank you, Arshil. Uh, 
Um, so yeah, uh, whenever we talk about education, uh, the discussion often veers into the direction of policy. However, in multiple other industries, we have seen that the changes, significant changes have been brought about by single companies or a group of companies. So do you think is it, it is possible for individual private enterprises to make significant changes or is it going to be primarily driven by policies and governmental intervention? Andreas, can you answer that? Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. You know, um, it's a difficult question. We do have some education systems that work on that basis. If you look to the, to the Netherlands or Belgium and Europe, uh, basically what the government does is provide the resources, but most schools are run by private entities. It's called a voucher school system. And actually, in those two countries, it works really well. But then you take Sweden, that introduced a similar philosophy in the 2000s and since then has seen the school system going downhill. Now, what's the difference between those two education systems? Well, if you go to Belgium and uh, the Netherlands, there's been a very strong policy framework behind that, you know, framework that made sure that parents only have good choices. You know, parents are not great customers in education. You know, the work that you do is not so obvious for, for, for parents. It's very hard as a parent to judge, you know, whether a shiny school <laughs> that looks very beautiful is really a good school with great teachers and so on. So uh, that's what we saw in Sweden. There was a lack of a regulatory framework. So in response to the question, the more you rely on, you know, private initiative, which can be a solution, the stronger your school system needs to be. And where we often make mistakes that we say, okay, you know, we don't need a school system anymore. We let a thousand flowers bloom and everybody does their own school. And then, you know, actually you're going to see what you have seen in, in the case of Sweden or to some extent in the United States. So actually it's the combination of, you know, a strong policy framework with individual and sometimes private initiative that can actually produce great things. Um, I would this I think I'd like to ask um, Zen to answer. <coughs> well, um, somebody is asking that with the enormous amounts, oops, that question just disappeared, sorry. But it was basically about, um, you know, given the amount of screen time that children spend on uh, devices today, do you feel like it's being adequately um, integrated into education? Is it sort of... Um, something that even teachers are empathetic towards or is it still a generational problem where everybody's like don't spend so much time so um in my opinion screen time is definitely an issue however if that balance can be cracked um between education and screen time and how to into and how to like um collaborate the two in fact um it can actually be majorly beneficial for example um the internet connects the world. So a child sitting in South India could do, um, could learn a course in Mumbai that they could never do physically. But through the help of technology and with the help of the internet, it connects the world. It connects education and helps helps truly grow a better system. If yeah. You know so absolutely. Um, the screen time, of course, is a negative factor and could be could be a negative factor in many ways if overused but if that balance is cracked and if it's truly understood how to make education benefit from screen time then i think it's truly helpful um we have a question that is um what is the way forward to collaborate on the ground uh, here in india many ngos are doing good work but still working solo and not collaborating and coordinating. Shaheen, you want to answer that? Is I mean, that it's, a yeah, it's so it's so hard. I, I think there isn't a, a lack of wanting to collaborate, but I think everybody feels so stretched and under-resourced that um, sometimes the important gets deprioritized. And I think as a result, there remains a huge amount of reinventing, making the same mistakes, not sharing knowledge with each other. But I do think it's changing. I mean, at the beginning of the pandemic, um, one of 
my friends, Vandana, who, who went on to lead the, the Akanksha Foundation after I left, she just started a little WhatsApp group initially for us to coordinate. Today, there must be more than like 300 education leaders on that WhatsApp group. It's sustained now for nearly three years. There's like lots of collaboration happening on it from, you know, sharing important articles to read, to job opportunities, to projects to work on together. So I actually think the pandemic was quite a turning point in getting people to just be having many more like real important collaborative discussions with each other. Oh, that's great to hear that, really. Because it would be awful if one has to keep reinventing the wheel, you know, endlessly. So um, we have Anuradha um, joining us in the audience. Hi, Anuradha, do you have a question? Yeah. Um, so some of the work that I do uh, at Teach for India has to do with uh, measuring uh, how well uh, students and classrooms perform. And I was wondering if some of that could be extended to schools, right? Because typically we find that conventional measures include student outcomes in terms of reading comprehension, math, and so on. But what Almas said really stood out to me, that a mindset of... Uh, a principal could actually make such a big change in how students of that school flower. What are some of those two or three metrics that reinvented and reimagined schools should be looking at to truly judge how well they're doing? Who do you want to address that to, Anuradha? I'd love uh, Wendy or Andrea's perspective here. Uh, would love a global perspective on this. Wendy, do you want to go? Sure. I think it's such a good question. Um, Personally, I don't think there's one answer to it. Like, I think the key is to come together first around a kind of local contextualized vision for what you're hoping for, for your students. Like, you know, given local values and context and culture and the challenges you know are facing kids in that place and your, the pathways to opportunity in, in that place, like what is the kind of, vision that you're working towards. And then we've actually developed at Teach for All a, a repository of all the best um, assessments we can find on a whole set of kind of holistic outcomes for kids. Um, we're just tapping into all the stuff that exists out there. We're not reinventing any wheels, but there's a lot. There are a lot of ways to measure some of these whole, you know, different outcomes that people are working towards, whether it be agency or creativity, et cetera. So I, but I think it starts by figuring out the vision, figuring out what you want to measure and then, and then accessing the measures that are already out there. Uh, and hopefully we're going to see many, many more strong measures over time. Um, thanks to the work of lots of folks, probably including Andreas. Yeah, actually, you know, we are doing some really interesting work with the state of Delhi at this moment to measure uh, social and emotional outcomes. And uh, they have a very interesting framework for that. And, um, you know, it seems impossible to measure, you know, empathy and curiosity, but uh, it seems impossible as long as you associate this with a traditional test. When you actually think, start to think differently about assessment, it's actually not that hard. I would actually say, you know, our measures of curiosity and empathy and collaboration are you know pretty robust and they are probably as robust as what we do in a traditional kind of school subject so actually i think we ne just need to be more creative in the, in the metrics and um i think there are now many really good good examples but it's worth for you to have a look at the work in, in delhi because they started out i think uh, four or five years already ago to you know frame those kinds of questions so they are very advanced in in assessing this thank you Wow, that's incredible to hear. I'm really pleased to hear. Um, can I ask you to elaborate a little bit more about how you would assess those kinds of things? I'm very personally interested to know because I really believe that's lacking in our, uh, in our methods of teaching and our priorities. Yeah, it's actually interesting. You know, the first time I asked your foundation for support because, you know, those are the kind of things that governments will never, you know, put their initiative, their, their, their weight behind. They will buy into this when it's established, but not to develop it. So I went to a foundation and the CEO told me, it's so interesting, but, you know, show me first that you can me measure empathy for a five-year-old child and then we talk again. So the premise was, that's just totally impossible. 
and actually, you know, we thought about it and we made it work. And it's turned out not so difficult. You know, what you do is you let a five-year-old child, you know, read a story on a tablet. You observe the reactions of that child and you get a pretty good measure of, you know, how a child, you know, sees, puts the shoes into that other person and how the characters relate. So it actually, once you start to think about the construct, you know, what is empathy at the individual level, at the kind of aggregate level, you find tools to do it and actually... Uh, we, we were able to do this. In fact, you know, it turns out that it's easier to measure things like empathy, curiosity, trust for small children than for older ones. No? Actually, small children are deeply engaging in the kind of tasks you give them. You just need to observe them carefully and you have a good good assessment. And that's and, uh, my next question, that when it comes to older kids and, and the top universities of the world, which are on some level a benchmark <laughs> for what we consider, you know, higher education, uh, that doesn't seem to be as overriding a quality that, uh, well, it is changing, I can see that, but um, it seems like that should really be the first thing, right? The idea that we're living in such a deeply interconnected world and, you know, what happens in one place instantly is going to impact another. And so this kind of selfish-based education just isn't going to cut it. Yeah, and you know, this is, I think, an issue where India struggles more than many other countries because you do have a system where, you know, those gateways, <laughs> the entry to university are still very narrow and very high stakes and that ripples down until early childhood education and care. So it really frames the whole perception of what education should be. You can build a wonderful curriculum, but at the end of the day, people look at what do I need to do to get my, my, my child into an IIT? And I think uh, changing the university exam system, I, I think, is a very difficult uh, nut to crack. But I do think you will not see deep changes in education without uh, addressing this. Why do I say this? Because, you know, you go to Indian schools, and I've been to many, you know, kindergarten and primary school are actually great. You see a lot of really innovative pedagogy. You go to middle school and secondary school that's where you know the whole system gets frozen because that's where you know orientation towards those gateways takes over and um so i think if you want to free up more space and there are some countries in asia that did that really successful you know korea used to be like like india and actually has you know changed the needle on this and uh, built a more open holistic way of uh, looking at un university entrance but I, I it's a hard thing to to deal with because indian universities are <coughs> highly autonomous and yeah. uh, so I think that's not a easy problem to solve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wendy, any solutions that come to mind uh, on how we can instill this value, which is so obvious to anyone who puts their mind to it, really, uh, but the fact of these values being um, applauded in when it comes to admission in higher higher education and therefore percolating down perhaps even in job in job interview i mean in when when people look at um uh, job uh, selection yeah. um, i mean i do really think I, i've recently been talking with some of the people in the u.s context who have been really trying to rethink what they're working towards at the at the secondary level and their conclusion after a decade of going at this is that like it doesn't work unless we rethink higher ed and it, it's just in the end parents revert to what they need to do to get their kids into like college um and so if we don't bring together these university presidents and really think with them about how to do something very different, I don't think we're going to get where we're all trying to go. So I don't know the answer, but I think it's going to start by convening these college presidents and having them rethink their mission in the world, um, which right now they're defining, you know, but they, they can rethink too. Like their role is so crucial in, in everything from preserving democracies and, you know, to saving the planet. So I think we're going to need to work with them. Maybe just one, one re reflection. I actually think that time is on your side. You know, I think universities that will not uh, change their practice in the entries, they will disappear. You know, young people will take a lot more ownership over what they learn and 
how they learn and when they learn and where they learn, we're going to see micro credentials, you know, much more granular uh, degree systems replacing this very lumpy kind of traditional system. So, and that's already happening. So I actually think, you know, it will be better for higher education to address it up front, but uh, time will be on, on, on your side if you, you know, take the ball and translate that into, you know, good curriculum design and development. Namita, can, can we bring Anjan? Anjan, in? she's one of the new circle entrepreneurs. I think she has a question. Hi. Um, thank you for this lovely discussion. Um, one of the things that I've been reflecting or contemplating upon is the fact that um, to a large extent, um, most of the parents seem to have a very narrow definition of what success is for their children and expect um, a certain amount of uh, uh, their academic standards that they had uh, to continue uh, for their children. So how are we preparing parents for the 21st century? Um, just like, you know, to a large extent, I feel parents need to be prepared um, more than the children because the children are ready for that kind of education. Um, um, so that's my question. How do we work with parents? Are there any examples of having worked with parents, um, preparing them for the 21st century? You know, I would say help them. You know, I think you cannot expect that parents are experts like you as, as teachers or educators. And often we make assumptions about the knowledge of parents that are, are not true. I think one of the most devastating trends in education over the last, you know, two decades has been a commodification of education. You know, we have made students consumers of passive, you know, content. We have made teachers some kind of service provider and we have made parents, you know, clients of a system. We have taken out the social fabric that actually makes education systems work. If you look at the countries that have really a strong education system, it's a whole of society enterprise. Teachers spend a lot of time to bring parents on board. You know, and, uh, parents are involved in many tasks in the kind of core instructional uh, base. <laughs> so I think actually that is the answer. You know, you need to invest more in bringing parents. If you make this conflictual, you know, you just call the parents and there's a problem with the child, you can expect the parents will defend their child and it's the end of the dialogue. And if you want to have a deep dialogue, you really need to bring parents um, Along, uh, you know, Japan is a, is, a, is a very interesting example where the most powerful organization in the Japanese education system is not the government or the teacher union, it's actually the parent teacher association. You know, they sit in every school, and that's as a parent where you can talk to other parents who know the system and who know the teachers. And uh, you need to invest in those linkages. If you get, you know, all the parents helping you as a teacher, you are in a very, very different ballgame than if they are just clients who have complaints mm. about your work. No. Thank you so much. We have Mohini um, and just the time check that uh, we don't have. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I I will set a context and then I'll ask the question. So I've I've been a part of Circle um, and I I was reading this book called How Children Succeed, and there was this um, question that I came up with in my head that it talks about content and character both integrating inside a school system, right? Um, I have been teaching for the longest time and the question that I want to ask the panel is like, how do you breach the gap between the resources for the teachers, mm -hmm. the teacher bandwidth um, that the teachers have in government schools um, or any NGOs <laughs> or wherever we are working? and the skill to bring that um, resource inside the classrooms. I think that there is a huge gap between all these three things um, that, that I have observed um, for the longest time. So, yeah. I think this is why we need the circle and we need people like you to take on rethinking how schools work because without taking a holistic approach to doing that, um, I, I don't know that we can answer that from here, right? Like I think the key to teacher development is, is really what happens within schools and the culture and collaboration that's 
set up by the school principal and, and getting all teachers, you know, really invested in a particular mission um, and creating the supports that enable them to essentially unlearn how they were taught and, and learn a different way of being, which will be crucial to work towards the vision that and mission that hopefully they're invested in. But without rethinking the whole thing, I think it will be really hard to get there. Well, I think, are we, are we ready to close uh, because of time? Okay. Well, I really want to thank all of you. I mean, it's just so inspiring to listen to each one of you and to believe that there are so many possibilities. I mean, just some of the examples you all have laid out and the approach that you all have laid out seems to suggest that we're all on the right track. And so thank you so much.